Hi, my name's Keith Cooper from North Light Images and this video is about making a print. It's about making a black and white print and I'm going to go through some of my thought processes and how I went from the original image that I captured through to a print, through to several, well, a version on a screen, and I'll come back to that, some prints and a final print that I'm happy with to actually frame and put up, although actually I might like it a bit bigger. But I'll come back to size and things like that. But I'm gonna look at editing from the original color image right the way through various processes I did. Um, a little bit of background on the print um, and the image itself. Now, it's a view down the River Orwell in Ipswich. Now, this is not far from where I grew up. Um, on the Suffolk coast and in many ways this um, this sort of image drives much of my early photography. Uh, my photography was, uh, my dad got me into it when I was about 12, 13 and this particular visit, this was taken on a cloudy drizzly rainy day looking down the estuary. Now I took the, uh, because people will want to know the technical aspects, and this is most definitely not a step-by-step -step recipe of how to make a print. This is about the principles behind why I did what I did. There are many ways of achieving the same results from a starting point. It's what you get to that counts. So if you're looking for a step-by-step -step guide, I'm afraid you're gonna be disappointed. Um, I rarely ever do that sort of stuff. Now, this was processed in Photoshop, but there are loads of other ways you could process the image. The picture itself was taken uh, one Sunday morning, uh, late one Sunday morning, uh, it was raining. We were actually going down, I was with Karen, and we were going to a meal with some of the remaining members of my family in Ipswich. Some of you may know uh, my father died last autumn, and at the time we weren't able to get everybody out for a bit of a meal. Not many people left these days of it. Um, it's one of the things, you know, as, as years go by, but, and I've never had a big family down in Ipswich anyway. But, so we were going to see people. So yeah, this, this has quite an attachment to me and never underplay the attachment of when you take photographs. If it means something to you, then that's important. I hope I've produced an image that people who know the area or maybe don't know the area will think that looks interesting. But when it comes down to it, I've not made that picture for you. This is a picture made for me, trying to sort of capture some of you know, what I was feeling. Anyway, enough of that. Um, what was it taken with? Fuji GFX 100S. The lens itself, unusually, is an Astra Hori 75mm f4. Now, they produce some image, some camera lenses, and this is a big chunky lens, fully manual, um, I, so I will have some more photos uh, looking into this uh, and you know, what you can do with it. It is not going to be a lens to challenge some of the Fuji lenses in terms of actual lens quality. And in fact, I suspect that if I was to use an adapted medium format lens from my old uh, M645 cameras, I might even get better results than this. But that's neither here nor there. It's a 75mm lens on a small medium format 33 by 44 sensor. A uh, view looking down the river. And you know, it's equivalent to what 55mm, 55, 60mm uh, on a 35mm full frame. So it's a it's not the normal wide angle lens that I use for a lot of stuff. Certainly not like some of these architectural shots. It is not a tilt shift lens or anything like that. It is just an ordinary lens. Now Immediately, I'm hopefully you can see quite clearly, and I will cut some of these images into this to make, try and make it a bit clearer on the video, that many people would look at that and say, way, that's massively overexposed. Well, it's not. It is quite deliberately exposed. I knew I wanted to make a black and white print from this view. I just decided I liked the view. We stopped the car looking down the estuary. And um, I thought, yeah, this will do nicely. I've exposed it so that the image doesn't clip anywhere. It's all exposed to the right, which of course means it comes out massively bright when you open it up. How have I processed the image? Well, I tried a couple of different ways. I processed it, I processed it 
using uh, DxO Pure Raw 4 to see what that would do to the image. That process in DMosaics, it leaves, gives you a DNG file. Quite like the look of that. Uh, excellent noise reduction in that. Not that you really need it. This is taken at 100 ISO, so I'm not going to cause much problem there. But it also, the demosaicing can bring out a little bit more detail in the shot. I then processed that DNG file with Adobe Camera Raw, and this is a, a screenshot of that. Now, you can see from the histogram that it is way over to one side, but it doesn't fall off the edge. It isn't clipping, and that's the important bit. There is detail in that sky, well, as you can see here from the, the black and white, but that's the starting point that I've gone for. We're looking at, the tide is not fully out, but um, yes, but it was raining at the time. Now, how much detail have I got in this? Well, these little boats, oh, there are masses of boats down the Orwell estuary. Yeah, it's, there. it's a bit of softness because it's raining, but also the lens itself is not exactly um, you know, cutting edge in performance. That doesn't matter though for this. Um, I've got 100 megapixels to play with here. These particular prints here are made on A3+, 13 inch by 19 inch, so that's just fine. Uh, I've got a larger print as well, which I'll show in a minute. But that's the detail. Um, it looks fine, there's, there's detail there. That can be sharpened up, that can be processed. I'm not concerned about that. There is actually a little bit of colour in the image, but I deliberately took this particular image to create a black and white print. And so right from the start, I knew I was going to be making a black and white print. Now, there's a little bit more contrast in the print and perhaps a little bit of detail starting to show in the sky there. Not much though. The, I altered the black point in my raw processing to stretch the histogram. I haven't done anything at the top end. I just altered the black point to stretch the data out a little bit more. Now this is, and I'm going to be working at 16-bit, so I've got no problem with getting with the results I'm going to get from the camera. There's no significant noise or any other problems with it there. So I've now got a more, a, an image which reminds me more of the scene I could see. And in fact, in this one, if you look carefully, there is a, you can see there is a tiny bit of colour in the water and various other places. One of the boys here uh, is, you can see it's red and you can see the green on the one opposite it there. But anyway, it's also, it's an estuary I know. I've sailed along here. Um, it is a beautiful place. Um, perhaps not necessarily in this weather, but at least it's flat and it's, uh, it's not rough at all. But, so that's my working point, just processing stuff in Adobe Camera Raw. Other ways of doing it. Um, if you want to go through this process and do it with Lightroom, knock yourself out. I've got about some of the considerations here that went into the picture. Now, the next bit is I've taken that file and I've opened it up in this instance in Nick Silver FX Pro. I've used Nick Silver FX Pro since it first came out in about 2007, 2008. I don't do much with it, but I often use it for the black and white conversion as much as anything because of its contrast enhancement abilities. I do not want to see halos or any effects like that. All I'm doing with this is I am using the Amplify White, Amplify Black sliders. I'm looking a bit at its structure settings in highlights, but really I'm just looking to change the tonality. And you can see already it's gone from a picture with not much detail in into one that's starting to bring out some of the cloud structure. Now, there was, yeah, the clouds, clouds were zipping about. It was raining on and off. So we've got a picture that looks quite different between it and is more like this. This, by the way, is the final print version. But I've used uh, Nick Silver effects there purely just to, I suppose you could say, crank up the atmosphere a bit. Um, I want that structure in the clouds. I want a sense of movement. I don't want a plain, flat, static image. I'm going to, and I'll show some examples in the prints of this, I'm going to be paying careful attention to that tonality in the sky there, but we've got the overall image and I'm happy with the direction I'm going. Now, what I would say is that this particular image, I worked my way through to a print version of it. 
I wasn't quite happy with it. But I knew where I wanted to get to. Then I went back to the raw file and went through the steps to that image much quicker because I knew what I was doing this time. I had an, an end point to aim for. And my second attempt at going through it was much better. Look, I was much happier with it. I tend to find over the years that if you find yourself doing too much to an image, now, and it isn't just finishing touches and tweaks and things like that, it could be that it's not just working. You have to accept that sometimes what you think is gonna be a great image doesn't work out that way. Sometimes the real picture of what you saw when you were standing there is as good as it gets and trying to represent it in a photo doesn't quite work, not in the way you wanted it. But anyway, I've got that. I've now got more detail in the sky that I can work with. Now in actually processing this image, what I've done, and I make extensive use of layers here, effectively what I've done is I've duplicated that uh, Silver FX Pro layer which is the one with the added contrast. And then I've added two versions of it together with slightly different masking. Now, what does this really mean? All it is, you could have duplicated that if you'd have used in Silver FX Pro, if you'd have used some of its built-in masking and viewpoint technologies. You could probably do most of this in that if you wanted. And there are obviously other ways of doing it. Uh, I'm not going to pretend I know how I, exactly how I do this in Lightroom because I don't use Lightroom. But I'm now at a point where the data is much more evenly spread in the image. And I've got these layers and that's fine. I've got the sort of uh, contrast amplification here, contrast amplification in the bottom. Now. There's one of the layers. Uh, that's just, I just made the mask loom uh, visible. So in this one, this is just doing the effect, applying the effect to the bottom here. And there's another one where it just applies it to the top, to the rest of the image. Why have I separated it into two? It just happens to be the way I think about an image like this in that I'm thinking that there are two very distinct parts of the image. There is the foreground, and there is the sky, and I may want to handle those differently. Now, I might then decide that just the layer that is addressing the sky, I want to do some more adjustments on that. I may decide I want to do some more adjustments just on the bottom bit. It just depends. One other bit, if you go back to the original, you may have noticed that the coverage of the foreshore in the original is quite a bit more. It's a four to three aspect ratio sensor with this. I want a wider look to it. Now that suits my particular stuff. My preference for landscape stuff tends to be wider images. And I have no problem in cropping and really removing quite a bit of the foreground here to push that horizon right down. Now I don't want it to move, remove too much and I've tried to make sure that I've kept some of the darker detail in the bit of the foreground here so that it doesn't just look plain. So there is still some detail, but I don't want lots of foreground. This is not a photograph of mud flats. This is a photograph of the sky, the boats, the river. So the foreground here is a little bit, you know, sort of hit and miss as to what, what you actually want in it. I could have lifted up the sensor a bit more, you know, point the camera up a bit, but I didn't really want to point the camera up too much um, because yeah, I'd got enough sky. I'd got the sky I want for it. I was thinking potentially at the time when I took it, that I might well end up cropping the image a little bit. So um, in this print, for example, there is about another that much off the bottom that I've lopped off and decided I didn't want. I would, in general, not do this until I'm happy with the overall look of the picture. I will then do the cropping and think how I want it. If I mess it up, I will save examples of this stepping through the process and I can always go back and I can redo it. I am not a great believer in non-destructive edit workflows. Um, they lock you into the particular tools you used for doing it, whereas this um, yes, I'm locked into using Photoshop layers and a few other bits and pieces, but those are not going to change. Um, I can open this image here and I can open this in Affinity Photo or something like that. There are loads of ways of doing it. As I keep saying, this is not about 
the step-by-step -step process. This is about where you start and the journey to get where you want to. And going through this process has helped me refine the idea of where I want to get to in the print. So that's the, uh, that's the chopping of it. Now, what about detail in it? Well, there's the detail for, let's just say I, I want to do some, I'm going to have to do some sharpening for print anyway, because there's some quite fine detail in the, on the shore here and in the boats. There's a zoomed in uh, picture of the, of the detail from this. It's quite a small part and there is lots of detail in the boats. That's the image as it is from the camera after initial processing. There we have a bit of sharpening. Now, why would I try different sorts of sharpening? Well, there's the original. There's a nicely sharpened version. And there's a not quite so much sharpened version. When I'm looking at, and I've got this image to a point where I want to actually make a print. And by the way, the, these prints here, these, these ones here, are on uh, Red River paper, pa um, uh, Red R Big Bend Barita. Uh, works very well. I'm printing them on the Epson P5000 here using the ABW black and white mode. So I'm happy with that. And this is just for testing purposes. Now, one of these sharpening instances here, I've used the sharpening in Nick Sharpener Pro. Another bit of software I've used for many years. And the other one I've sharpened using uh, Topaz Sharpen AI. Now I'm using the standalone version of it, but it's available, I believe, in, in various bits, other bits of software. They keep changing things, but I've got the version I like working here, Sharpen AI. So I've got my original there. And if I use Sharpen AI, I get some really quite nice detail in it. Now, remember this is tiny. There's the sharpening from Sharpen AI. You might think, well, which is best? Well, since I'm experimenting a bit, I thought what I do is I will do two prints of this image. Now I know I'm gonna to have to do some more editing of tone and the likes of it, but I wanted to actually see, and these are A3 plus 13 by 19 prints. One of them, and I do have to have a look on the back. One of them is the printed version using Sharpen AI. One of them is using Nick Sharpner. Can I see any difference? Not a chance. Um, I needed to put on, without getting a hand lens out and looking very closely, at this scale, I needed to put three pairs of glasses on to be able to just barely detect a difference in fine detail between these prints. These are printed at the high quality setting, not the highest quality setting on this printer, printed at high quality setting. And at that setting, there is a very slight difference between, but it's pretty minimal. Um, so in effect, I've discovered that too much faffing about with the detail on here is not important at this scale. Now, this is a 100 megapixel, well, less than 100 pixel, 90 megapixel image now, because I've cropped it. At some point, if I want to print this at six foot by four foot or something like that, then these sharpening differences are going to make a difference, a visible difference. But only even then, we're talking a six foot by four foot print, where people come up to it and look at it at that distance. Will you notice any difference? So at this scale, Worrying too much over sharpening is a bit of a waste of time because um, I seriously, unless I'd written on the back, certainly with just ordinary glasses on, I cannot tell which of these prints was sharpened with which sharpening. So whether it's that or whether it's that makes no real difference. So when you see stuff, people going on about print sharpening, how important it is, yes, it is very important, but I also incorporate as sharpening the overall look of the image, because when you sharpen detail, you can change the contrast of areas with fine detail in them. Uh, it also, um, it is an aspect of sharpening in making these clouds show up a bit more. So that's, that's with that. Right, so I've got these two test prints. They've convinced me there's enough detail. There's nothing wrong with which I've got the composition I like. I've got the overall balance I like. What to look at next? Well, when I print, um, I'll often apply a, an adjustment layer. 
uh, this one is just a levels adjustment and this is just to make sure that the black is black and that the white point is not somewhere in the, in the light greys. Now to this point all I do is just to remove the lower the white point a bit it changes the overall contrast of the image and I get after an adjustment like that I get a, an image with and I'm not sure entirely that this will show completely on the uh, on the video but I get a, a darker looking image well that's exactly what I'd expect because I've made the blacks a bit blacker and I've made the lighter parts a bit lighter so I've got that image there so that's printed there now I've printed that one and I look at that and so this is one of those bits where you just sometimes it helps to leave it overnight even you look at the image and I just decide that this darker bit of cloud is just a bit too dark I don't want that dark bit in the middle I want it lighter in the middle With pictures like this if you tend to have a slightly lighter middle and dark around the edges it draws the attention in and I'm thinking this yes I like this cloud structure but this bit of cloud here is just a little bit too dark so what I've done is I've added another adjustment layer and there is nothing wrong with just stacking adjustment layers up on top of each other with things like this each layer has a particular meaning so this particular meaning is dealing with this dark area here so with this particular one where I've darkened it I've used the masking to reduce the amount of darkening in the middle here now that gives me and this is where I do have to look at it that gives me this second print here where this middle bit is just not quite so prominent it doesn't draw you it's there it's part of the structure it doesn't draw your attention to it quite the same way that this one now this is very subtle stuff and you need to actually have a look at prints for this looking at it on the screen this lot looked fine on the screen this is where looking at prints and actually thinking well do I like that bit a bit lighter or a bit darker so we've got the darker bit here the not quite so dark one on here so we've moved from this to that well that's now getting to a point where I'm really quite happy with how it looks I can use you know the, the kind of curve I'm using for these adjustments of overall tonality is one here that's just a simple curve you drop the midpoint of it and that will make the whole image just a little bit darker remember to the differences between watching on screen and with print um, that comes partly from experience but if ever there was an example of a picture that looked great on screen that didn't quite print right this is one of them now normally I know enough and certainly when I'm doing color stuff I tend to know enough about the detail that I'm going to have to deal with to know about this and how much I need to light and darken things compared with what's on screen remember the print is what matters the screen is just an intermediate stage it doesn't matter but I said I printed this on a brighter paper now this paper excellent paper the blacks here are quite black the whites it's, it's a nice a nice tonal range but I want a little bit of a softer feel to it I don't want um, an element of harshness in some aspects of it so I decided to print it on uh, a change to a roll paper and print it on this one is Epson it's a smooth bright white art paper cotton rag art paper so it's another bright white paper I might if I was doing a big print of this I might print it on a warmer paper you know a, a, a natural paper but here is the print printed on this and here is print test but on 17 inch roll so I've printed it slightly smaller to fit width wise here is a print printed on this is fine art cotton smooth now this act this paper this is an Epson branded one but I happen to know it's an I, an over IFA 115 
Um, if you have a look in, inside, the label will actually give that away. There are various other ways, but this is, um, this is a standard cotton rag art paper. I could print this on a Hannemuller paper, Canson, anything like this, but this one, I happen to know, works well in this particular printer. Once again, I'm using the ABW print mode. I've dialed in a minus five setting on the tint to, because it does come out a little warm on the P5000, something when I was testing the P5300, I didn't need to do. So P5300, if I printed this, I would print it as is. But on the P5000, I need a slight tint adjustment just to get this right. Because you're seeing it on video uh, with various types of lighting around here. So I'm no uh, accurate way of telling you what it's going to look like um, you know, until I check the actual videos. But there is the print on that. Now, immediately, this is a, a, a smooth paper. So there's no texture to it. But already I prefer the contrast of the foreshore here. The look, the clouds, they look smoother. Um, it really does make quite a difference. Um, so I've got print now that I like. I've lightened this area here a little bit. I've cropped it. I've processed it from the original almost overexposed version and I've now got a version of the file that I'm really quite happy with printing. Now it's got loads of layers in it. This is the this is the final print version I think. Now some of these things I might change, it might do differently. But remember, as I said, this is not about a step-by-step -step guide. This is the process I went through to arrive at this point. It's quite possible that looking at this image, if I was certainly if I was going to if somebody wanted me to print a six foot by four foot version of it, I would go right the way back to the raw file, know where I want to get to, and probably think of a much simpler process to get to this, including the sharpening, various other bits and pieces, and resizing, certainly if I was printing at six foot by four foot. So that would be another workflow for a big print. But that's printed on that. What about full size print? Well, here it is. This is printed. Now I'm going to try and see if I can get this so you can see most of it in the in the video there. I just check the monitor. Yes. So this is printed at uh, 17 inch by 25 inch, 26 inch. I can't remember the paper size I used for it, but this is printed directly from Photoshop using the ABW print mode. And that is the version that I am happy with. Now. I've got all these other versions of it and um, I shall probably keep them and use them when I'm doing some teaching at some point to, yeah, to, to show stuff. But I've got fine detail, which is a little bit more visible now, the fine detail at this size and obviously larger sizes, as I've said, I might re revisit this. But in general, I'm happy with the image. Um, it has the right distribution of tonality, draws you into the picture. But the key thing is, and this is the number one thing about it, this picture reminds me of that morning. And that's the important bit. Now, you can't always have emotional connections and drivers in doing a picture like that. In fact, I, I would hope most of the times you didn't. But even when I'm trying to do architectural photography, I'm as much guided by the basics of composition and then deciding does that work as an image makes a big difference. So whether it's a cathedral or a modern structure or something like that, there has to be some connection with it. Now, I'll admit that that is strained a bit when I'm photographing industrial units and some modern buildings. It is tricky, but it always helps to have that connection with things. And certainly if you know you're going to be doing a print, think ahead as to what's needed for the print. Um, now, I hope that's been of some interest and it can give some guide and some inspiration, some ideas perhaps for how to approach editing. The, the mechanics of the editing were unimportant here. That's stuff you can get through practice. That's stuff you can look up aspects of that. The key is actually looking at the picture 
and seeing how it works. Anyway, if you've got any questions, let me know. Thanks very much for watching and um, cheers.